Hey, what's good, people? This is episode 113. This is the Option Podcast. That is Mary Beth Gigi Rose Gingrich. PhD. Or not. The episode starts <laughs> right now. It's good, Mary Beth. It's good, Gigi. How you doing? What's going on? What's going on, brother? I'm How good. you doing? I'm all right. It was yeah, it was hot as balls here, man. Like a couple of days ago, like even the South Bay reached like 80 degrees. Um, yeah, and you know the beach players, man. They're like, we doing this nine to eleven because that sand turns hot from like <laughs> yeah, from like humidity. twelve to two. Feet start to look like roast beef. How's it? Out <laughs> How's it out there? It's good. It was actually raining today, but it was you know refreshing yeah <laughs> i like the raid oh we had a storm here too oh yeah yeah we and that's something you don't see in the south bay and i mean lightning was just it was just bitching it was had it big enough attitude. did it have did it have a name did the storm have a name no but we should call it minerva or something i don't know <laughs> so, uh, but uh, you know something something mm -hmm. like a Something a mother gives her daughter a name to make her angry for the rest of her life, like Gertrude or something. <laughs> you know, you know, someone yep. would be like, Ma, really? All of these names and you had to give me something like that. You already The redheaded stepchild name. Yeah. yeah. It's like you already said I'm not gonna run for president because you gave me this name. Thanks a thanks a lot, Ma. <laughs> but but then again we had what? We had Barack Obama. So I think I think that kinda like that kinda like reset everything, didn't it? Yeah. So definitely so um hey let's tell our audience what you've been up to this is there's a reason why i brought you on you have you have a um a certain skill uh a, a set of skill sets that that go within the wheelhouse of our conversation we're gonna we're gonna tackle um veterans homelessness we're gonna talk a little bit about ptsd um so in brief detail without telling people who who you really are <laughs> <laughs> tell tell people what, what what your specialties are. What do you? All right. So um, I am a veteran, a combat veteran, Operation Enduring Freedom, Afghanistan. Um, I also my bachelor's degree, which once you get a certain height, it doesn't really matter what no. your bachelor's degree is in. No, <laughs> bugger it's, off. Uh, right. It's a uh, criminal justice and then my master's degree is in clinical social work and then I finished all my coursework but I'm still working on my dissertation for my PhD in clinical social work and family interventions nice we're gonna call you Dr. Gingrich in, oh. in time because I know people don't want to call PhDs doctors but stop it come on man yeah they need to well actually this is this is I said PhD but it's a doctorate but it's a DSW so it's more on the clinical side so it's oh. a doctor doctor of social work but it would be DSW not PhD correct myself there dude look I got a doctor in podcasting <laughs> I'm the doctor of podcasting you're a beast you're a beast <laughs> there's, there's levels to this yeah <laughs> isn't it crazy what the hell what I've, we've I've done in like 113 episodes I'm not look for the people listening and the people who are probably going to turn it off right now because I'll start talking about myself. But but <laughs> it hasn't been perfect. Nothing's perfect. If you look at yeah. anything that anyone's ever done from the beginning, it's terrible. Right. <laughs> it's terrible. You ever saw Joe Rogan's first episode? He had a flashlight in the back and all you could see was him and I think like Brian Callen, not Callen, um, <laughs> Brian Redband. And he's on 1500, right? But I think so far so good. I'm going to make, I'm going yeah. to probably make a ton of more mistakes. So... Dad, I mean, there's so much to talk about because there's so, so much that happened in current events, man. I mean, Zuckerberg, I want to talk about tomorrow. I got someone coming on tomorrow that's going to help me with that because I, I saw CNN and I saw him testifying again in front of Congress, like how Facebook is harmful to children. I just turned it off. I said, get get the fuck out of here, man. Get out of here with that. Stop. Man. Yeah. So we are here to talk specifically about something that is very, very near and dear to us, and that is... What happens to people when they end their time in the service or what we call acrimoniously ETS, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's PCS, right? Uh, um, process and change in uh, assignment or yep. something like that. Um, change of station and ETS, ending time in service mm -hmm. for, our, for our military and civilian population. 
there are so many things that cause veterans to be homeless all right and there were there are a bunch of bu bunch of great articles we looked up and what i'd like to do i want to put them up so our audience can look at it and then we can we could address them one at a time um and actually first of all we got to call bullshit we got to see if these reasons make sense right right, uh, uh, right. and then and then we kind of go from there so out processing when you pr out process there is this buttload of information they're trying to feed you in such a really really short time frame like what five days like out processing yep. or whatever i believe the process is called a capping they send you to an office and then they just do a whole bunch of briefings and just shove a bunch of stuff down your throat and hope you make it when you get out let's talk more about that what what are what's one of the, what are some of the educating some of the people what are some of the um reasons why no sorry let's out processing what are some of the things that we have to the educating our civilian population what are some of the things we 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 have to or they try to let us know before we go right so i out process like 11 years ago <laughs> mm -hmm. um but what i do remember is that we sat in there we had a lot of paperwork that we had to fill out they would walk you through doing your claims for if you have any disabilities. They'll go through all of your medical records with you. They do, I think, legitimately, depending on, of course, who's the, who the instructor is, they do try to set you up. Um, maybe not perfectly. They also provide you resources to get a job if you're not if you don't have a job. They give you instructions and kind of walk you through how to use the GI Bill. Or um, there's also something called... Um, um uh i'll come I'll, I'll when i remember it it's it's for disabled veterans but they also will pay for your school as well um voc rehab vocational rehab so that's another program that on top after you finished using your gi bill they will continue to help you pay for school and pay bah which is basic allowance for housing um and so a lot of people leave and just get into school. They also show you how you can use your licenses for whatever your MOS. Well, remember, I was Army, so I can't speak for all military. Right. They're Mil different but military occupational specialty. Right, Yoga. right. And that's for the, the Army. They call it that. Mm -hmm. um, but your job in the military, essentially, you have a lot of experience with that. You have licenses to drive whatever vehicles you were driving or operate whatever machinery um so they'll teach you to essentially bring that into the civilian world and have it make you money um if you want to keep the same position which for service members especially after being in for more than eight or ten years that's all you know so who yeah. wants to start over a lot of people don't um they don't get out with family support a lot of you know people who were in the system group homes and stuff they join the military uh, because they have no other place to go so when they get out they need these kinds of supports and they need to know what they can do as a next step so in order to do that you need to have these resources that they're giving you when you acap um a lot of people are getting out real banged up and they're not medically retiring so they're not getting all the benefits of a retiree um, so when you get out, you only get one year to still go back on the base. Once your GI Bill is done, it's done. Um, if none of your claims go through, you, nobody's going to come back behind that and help you appeal the process. If you applied for, oh, I have this neck strain, I had this surgery, my knees got damaged in the military, and then they deny your, your claim for disability, you can appeal that. And most of the time it gets approved after. Um, the problem is... Who do you go to appeal it? Usually when they get the, the, the denial paperwork, they're like, well, I guess I'm not getting yeah, that. Let's go home, boys. <laughs> Another rejection. Right. Yeah. Right. But there's yeah. just so many. There's legal resources. There are people who do this for free law offices that just like in the civilian world, you know, if they win your case, they're going to ask for a percentage. But this is something you'll get for life as a service member. Um, so at the end of the day, I mean, I really think that they do try with their systems. I'm not going to take away all the credit, but I do think that some things are lacking. Some people need special attention for you to sit down with them individually and help them. Um, and unless you go to the right place, you find the right private practice and walk in and they, they take your insurance or they have a sliding pay scale, if you even have insurance, because you know they take your TRICARE. <laughs> so, yes, they do. Yeah. Right. So 
where do so, you go? What do you do? So chiming in just a little bit for people to mm -hmm. understand the Montgomery GI Bill. The Montgomery GI Bill is an education benefit that mm -hmm. they give you X amount of money per month should you choose to go back to school or college, all right? The Montgomery GI Bill on its own is not a whole lot of money unless you want to go to like a city university, a community college, or some state colleges that, that will help to put you through. Private universities, it, it, I, I mean, it's barely enough to pay for the dorms. So some people get something called the Army College Fund as a supplement to the um, Montgomery GI Bill, depending on how score, how high you score in your entrance exam to get into the military. So the higher you score, the more things you're eligible for and the more jobs that are open because you just scored high on their math and their, their, quick, their quick assessment, stuff like that. So, um, you know, you scored high. I actually scored pretty high. I chose to be a generator mechanic instead of um, getting into to finance or like accounting. Or I wanted to be a chairborne ranger, but they told me like um, uh, five years was the minimum term for enlistment. So I was like, "Fuck that!" You know what else you're selling? <laughs> and the guy was like, "All right. ki all kinds of shit," you know. So he showed me, showed me, uh, showed me like all the lights went out, and then the, these soldiers came in, fixed, it, and all the lights went back on. I'm like, "That was." <laughs> you want to talk about good recruiter, <laughs> man? I was a man. I was a good ass recruiter. So. All right, so with that being said, the Army College Fund and the Montgomery GI Bill for state and city and universities probably funds the whole thing and even gives you some cost of living. It's really, really good. However, what they don't tell you is that it expires 10 years after you leave. So if it's one of those things where you need to a home or a place, like you're not going to go to school and be homeless, right? You, uh, uh, some people cannot go to school unless they feel like they have some kind of feet under their ground carpet on mm -hmm. first chakra stuff your job your security be able to pay your rent how are you going to go to school and you can you know unless you want to live with your parents or unless you're in a situation where people have to support you which is very rare because the right. longer you serve the more reluctant that person is to take care of you right, right. so i mean <laughs> if you did a right. one-off like i did three years yeah i could show my mom whatever but the reason why i'm mentioning this is because it expires 10 years after you leave um, and there are still other ways that you can get your education benefits. It's just about us, which we're, we're the reason why you're even on this podcast. I was hoping me and you could help interpret what the real problems are. And the more we interpret what the real problems are, we put our heads together and like tell our art, give our audience may, maybe active solutions and suggestions on how to work around it. Something you said really, really important. Um, the resources are there. It's just about it's about getting to them. So that's one. Yep. Uh, two is uh, the second thing, the caveat, like legal services, the difference between legal services in the army from the military and legal services in the civilian population is the military, they get paid regardless of, of whether you do, do well or not, you fare from their right. advice or not. The civilian population, the reason why they take a contingency is because if they lose, they get nothing. They're out of cost for investigations, they're out of, you know, cost for everything. So a lot of those ambulance chasers only make money if you make money. They're they're right. they're out if you if you lose. So um so I got it up. Finally got it up. Man, I better have I mean I feel like good. All right. And boom. really quickly, just piggybacking off the GI Bill thing yeah, and the resources, there is if you go, you can go straight to Google or if you want, we can link it at the bottom later. But um, there is a phone number just particularly for GI Bill. And it's not just for the Montgomery. Now they've made something where you can transfer your Montgomery GI Bill into the post 9-11 GI Bill. So now you'd be able to use it that way. So um. Yeah, you can always Google that number too. That's its own resource, and people don't even know that number exists. I'm gonna look that up as we uh, um, after this. Right. Um, in fact, I might let's show our audience now. These are the three major reasons, um, and I found this on GreenDrop.com. Um, sorry, GoGreenDrop.com, which I think is a pretty good website. Um, not completely reliable, but their reasons are logically connected. So one of the one of the things are physical injuries. All right. Now I'm going to zoom in on this, and this is so true. When service members return from home injured, it's often their families who have to provide the care, right? Um, I they they I don't know the extent of, so we're going to stop right there. Uh, there are other ways that veterans that the the government or the U.S. Army cares for their own when veterans come out injured. Do, do they have dis, do they get disability checks? So how does that? What's the process for that? So there are disability checks, and if you go to your local VA. Um, which is your veterans affairs, like the, the big one, it's usually got a hospital connected to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not one of the small vet centers, 
But the VA, if you go and you ask them where you could make your claims for your disabilities, there are people who are just, it is their job to sit down with you and review your medical records with you so that you can put in the, submit these claims and go ahead and get a percentage, which veterans know a percentage is like if you're 50 percent 60 percent then you're getting 1300 dollars per a month or 70 percent right. i think is more like 18 and that's a month um you have that you also if you are homeless and you have nowhere to go as a veteran um not much i don't want to go too political but not much great came from the trump era but one good thing that did was that the va systems have been improved. You're able to get appointments quite a bit faster. Um, They do also have this thing called community care, where if your provider can't get you in for an appointment within the next, I believe it's seven business days, they have to refer you to a community provider and you can, of your choice, and they will pay for it. So with living expenses, if you don't, of course it's gonna be, it took like a year and a half to get approved for most people. Um, And then they back pay you. So you just wake up with like, $30,000 $30,000 in your account. But <laughs> so you do from the date of your claim, mm-hmm. you will get paid um, as long as it gets approved. But until then, there are veterans homeless programs all through them and they will find a place for you. They will have it inspected for you. And then they're just as strict as like the the people who are on Section 8 where they have like really strict guidelines on like assessing the, the the things in housing and stuff like that. So they'll go ahead and inspect the house for you. They'll pay the first, I think, two months rent up for you and then expect you to pick it up on your own. So they'll get you housed. There's so much more veteran housing since the Trump thing. That's the only real like big, big benefit. He was here yeah. for the veterans. Look, I, I think um, I speak for both of us. That. Neither one of us liked the guy. It's not about right. liking the guy. Right. I didn't want to no. say it like, I don't, no. I don't know how you roll on here, but I mean, I well, am not a Trump fan, but I will yeah. say that he did improve the system for the VA. I, will say I think that. a lot of people that continue to follow this podcast know that my um, affection or contempt for someone does not uh, affect my critical uh, my critical thinking skills we don't right. i think i speak for both of us too we don't have a set of rules for people I'm we like and what we don't yeah these things, no but we know? don't have a set of rules for people we like or don't like right like it's right. not it's like if if i don't like trump i'm not going to assume he has a little dick or something right because <laughs> like anything that's untrue about the guy anything that's bad about the guy i'm going to assume is true because i don't like him i mean what are, what are we like fucking 12 years old right so, you go with so we, speaking in the best interest yeah, even if so, you don't like their face but it's that's fun. something that we i wanted to get out of the way just for our audience to be like oh they're anti-trump no no we're not no. we're just we 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 point out when he does well and we and we call him out when he doesn't do well but this on and on this with that being said uh, uh you're right you're right. How much do you think that, because um, we're approaching mental illness as a, as a next subject, mm-hmm. how much do you think, and I was thinking about saving that question, but how much do you think electronic filing has to do with this? In 2009, like medical records were allowed to be illegally um, maintained through electronic filing. You were still you, you still had to keep paper files or whatever and this and that, but I think I think, and I want you to chime in on this. I think that since from from civilian to the military, I'm gonna that's how I'm gonna go from civilian because I worked in a medical practice for 17 years. That qualifies me to speak about this. Um, we're both, dude. We're both we're both just, we're both gonna call ourselves experts on this. All right. So um, in 2009. Since it, uh, filing became electronic, you didn't have to worry about Dr. Sloppy handwriting for prescriptions. You didn't have to worry about him giving the wrong dose or not recognizing signatures. Someone got admitted to the ER, right? If that doctor's office was affiliated with that hospital, the medical records, boom, on a computer, you don't have to call an office to say, mm-hmm. can you fax this and wait for them to fax it over. You didn't have to call the service if the doctor's office is closed and say, hey, I need you to, to, I need the doctor to call me back on this and this and that. And eventually you talk to the doctor anyway. So there were so many advantages in the civilian population, but to my understanding, it was a military experiment first. But so my question to you was, how much did did electronic filing and electronic maintenance and and medical records and civilian records um, have to do with um, the productivity of veterans getting their benefits? I'm gonna be honest with you. I was a forklift driver in the military. 
operated a couple of cranes. I don't know how they do it direct military. I know that um, right now I'm with a private practice that we are electronic and we do see service members when it comes to anything prescriptions. And I'm also a user of the VA system. So firsthand, um, I'll say if there's a prescription or something that, that I need, it, I just go straight to the VA um, pharmacy and I get it like 10 minutes later. Um, but so that's great. They do have it in the system. They don't have to send it down and you wait for Tony to figure out who, you know, <laughs> but, but Tony, um, what's up, man? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's midnight. But no. So I, I did um, at request my medical records before from the VA um, and I got it paper. I didn't get it uh, in a in a like I got a, a big packet file that like folded around each other. I think that some things need to be paper. Yeah. Um, but I also don't think they had it sitting in the back somewhere. I think that they you think they it. printed it. Yeah. Right. And then they'll give it to you upon your request. Mm. So um, I don't I don't think that 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 system if there's anything that needs system updates, it's probably the smaller businesses. I'm sure that when it comes to electronics and stuff, I really would hope that they have those systems in order and that they have the best ones um, and not dinosaur type of situations going on. I mean, when I go to the VA, I don't see like a really old computer with a whole big back sticking out. I actually <laughs> see flat screens. <laughs> so I'm assuming that Man, they have we hope so. We Right, right. I hope so. But really, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on an, on a matter that, you know, I really don't know about. Um, no, I don't but know from about your, that. But you can only speak to your personal experience, right? Right. If you need First drugs, experience. you get them quick. If you need your records, bam, it's there on a the computer. You could, they can print it if, yeah. you know, so. Um, all right. So moving on to reason number two. These are the three major reasons. And again, you and I give ourselves a liberty to agree or disagree on how much or... or um, not get trapped in a false trichotomy, if you will. Right, like, right. Lim oh, and lim right before eliminated that. into only three choices. Go ahead. Right before that, I did want to add just to that subject because I don't want to go back and forth skipping around. That gets messy. So I just wanted to add to that that I think that if there is something that you are requesting, like your records or you need an appointment, I think that it's less of a system problem when it comes to technical and more of a protocol problem because they have so many rules on okay you have to have this done within 30 days and then we can give you this i think it's more of like a protocol problem when it comes down to things uh getting done and you getting managed and what you need your care but at this point like i said there's that community care thing if they can't get you on time they have to pay for you to go to somebody else so that was that was it Just no that. that makes that makes complete sense so second reason is um and we'll go into this um uh, mental uh, mental illness and this is a touchy subject because, well, first of all, PTSD is a real thing, right? You are experiencing certain things and a certain stress. Like you don't even have to watch someone's leg get blown up to to have to to be in a stress to be in what we call a stressful situation in the military, right? I mean, just serving during a wartime situation, knowing that the threat is imminent is, is, is stressful. Sometimes you have, you run into it, you have an asshole commander, you know, and your property, your government property, you have to do basically whatever this guy says and you have to do, and it's not like a job where you just get to quit, <laughs> right? You can't just be like, you know what? I quit. I'm out. I resign. I'll give my two weeks notice. You can't. As an enlisted soldier, you, you sign a contract. You have to fulfill that term. So, so there are, so PTSD notwithstanding, because PTSD is the extreme example of mental illness. All right. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about different shades of, right. of mental health and mental illness. So, I guess it's almost a rhetorical question. How much do you think mental illness or how much do we correlate mental illness with veterans homelessness? Um, I would say almost 100 percent. Yeah. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. I mean, someone came up with this re crazy number, like only like out of, th out of 50,000 people, like like only 3 percent of them were like mentally ill. And I'm like, you would know that. <laughs> how would you know that? <laughs> If I was taking are, a guess, hey, are you are was, you a vet? Are you sane? Okay, that's right. one. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> if I was taking a guess and I was in a class, I would I would be up in the nineties at least somewhere. Yep. Um, yep. And that's just because 
people who like that person who would have answered that question, they either aren't a vet or they don't have a lot of experience um, in regards to mental illness. Um, so a lot of people think that it's not real anyway. Um, so like, no, this person doesn't have PTSD. They're just angry and they have a reason to be angry or this person's not depressed. Everybody gets down sometimes. So if you don't understand the symptoms and the diagnostic criteria that go into having a mental illness or being diagnosed with a mental illness, then you can't really speak on whether someone is mentally ill. But usually if someone is homeless and a veteran, there's something that impacted that. Um, not saying you must be mentally ill in order to be a homeless veteran, but I'm saying that that veterans probably experienced something that a lot of our veterans, they're so mistrusting of the government and of the system that they choose to be homeless. And if you come to them and offer them all of the resources, they'll actually refuse them. They're they like, no, to, hell to with live you. in the woods. They're like, look, this is what I know. This is where it's at. They'd rather do that than try to come in and sign all these documents and then have to talk to somebody every month and have to do all that. They, they've just completely clocked out. And if you can't say that that's not some kind of trauma or mental illness, <laughs> and you that's think not that mental they're illness, just, I don't know what it is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, it's crazy that to me, I was just thinking there's a mistrust because you just, you just came on to something that I didn't think about before. I just thought in the, in the past, this again, this is before uh, uh, filing and stuff like that became more advanced and more electronic. I, I served from 90 to 93, all right? So everything was wads and wads of paperwork. And like you said, if someone's like, this is your veterans uh, separation packet, this is going to help you how to become a civilian. Um, this is You're getting out in three days if you read all of this. And I'm like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. So there is a level of disc... Um, I'm not going to say they're intentionally discouraging people, but I'm, all I'm trying to say is that if getting some of these benefits is so damn difficult, I just think people get, I, th I just think these guys that get out where, um, I'm not saying their job was simple, but serving is simple. Getting, getting there, doing what you're told, doing your job. There is a simplicity of doing something in, in this Absolutely, high stress environment. A routine. And then, then all mm -hmm. of a sudden you're out and there, and before where you could just, you say, hey, I need this. And I'm like, no, you got to do this. You got to see this person. And after that, see that person sign this, wait four days. And you're just like, mm -hmm. fuck that shit. What else? I mean, maybe I just don't do anything about it. Right? right. I, I mean, think about it. Like, let's say I have pain in my left arm or my left shoulder or whatever. And it's tough to get an appointment. And then uh, the specialist, and then I'm a first time person there and they, they don't have any paperwork. And, and then they find that that's not my zone. I got to go to that VA hospital. I'm just like, tell me, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to vilify ve some veterans for their lack of persistency, but that shit is, that shit's depressing. <laughs> no, you know what? I don't think a veteran should have to have any persistence. I think that people should be coming to them to fix these injuries. <laughs> to be honest, I, I would, they, they, they shouldn't be vilified for lack of persistency. I think that we should be vilified for lack of persistency Amen. because we're deterring them from using the resources that are available to them for free. Mm -hmm. We're just making it so hard for them that they're just like, forget it. But I don't want to, I'm not going to go through all of that just to fix my arm when I could just pop a couple of ibuprofens and do what you were told to do in the military. Just drink some water and keep it moving. Yeah. Well, I agree with you for one major reason. And this, this is, this is, this pretty much shuts the door on that. When they were recruiting people, we didn't come to them. They came on to these guys. These recruiters <laughs> are on our block. Hey, son, what are you doing in the next five years? <laughs> you look kind of strong. Think you think you got what it takes to be a soldier, you know? Uh, um, right. So did, is that something where we were pursuing them? No, they when they were recruiting the whole process, in fact. The well, entire process, point. but the entire yeah. process is about them coming to us. They're on our block, knocking on our door like Jehovah's Witnesses. It's particularly mm -hmm. in, like, I, we grew up on Flatbush Avenue, right, Brooklyn? Yep. The, yep. That's a poor neighborhood, and they're not... Chester Court. You're not going to see these recruiters in, in on the Upper West Side. They, 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 they're, they're going for the... the, the I'll, yeah. I'll just say street kids. They're going for the street kids. But, um, so, that's the process. And the other process is... Let's say we declare war against Iraq because 
Iraq took over Kuwait because Kuwait caught us di <laughs> diagonal drilling, right? Diagonal drilling into Iraq. And it's like, how dare them stopping us from diagonal drilling? Let's send soldiers in, right? When it comes time to approve a budget to go to war, nobody asks where that money's coming from. And you, you want to talk about, we were talking about, we don't want, we didn't want to get political. This is the best way we can stay apolitical on this, or not apolitical, or like multi-political on this. You never see Democrats and Republicans fight each other. Um, when it comes time to send someone to uh, Afghanistan or, or wherever, or, or bomb this place or this place, you never see Democrats and Republicans um, <laughs> With apologies, the Crips and Bloods, of course. I mean, I didn't mean anything, fellas. Right, uh, I'm um, not in this Yeah, I want to apologize to them. No, but you never hear them <laughs> fight about how entitlement spending. You never hear them fight about um, where's this, where are we going to get the money. They just, they have a budget proposal. They all sign off on it. But yep. when it's time for them to ETS, for my people at home, ETS means end your time in the service. And this person needs some, something. Do we... We, we should vilify ourselves when we dare. We have the, the, the nerve, the unmitigated gall uh, um, to say, where are we going to get the money from? Bullshit. Bullshit. So that's, that's I was, man, that was a long spiel. You definitely, you, no, thank you. No, that thank, was really good. You gave me the floor on that, that really one. Good. But that's, that was the point I'm trying to make. It, we should, it is our yeah. responsibility because we as a nation set it up like that to recruit people. To, to join this we signed the not contract. just people like yeah. kids like they're still in high school you're putting them in a delayed entry program so that they could so by the time they graduate high school <laughs> they're already owned they already swore in before they graduated and now when they are to deploy <laughs> nobody has any questions <laughs> they are holy shit you're raising your hand at 16 and a half years old Whew. right like when i graduate i promise myself to you yes that's it that's it oh my god it took me three months after AIT to deploy. Three yeah. months to wow, go a dude. year to Afghanistan, to Kandahar. How long was your AIT? My AIT was probably about nine weeks long. Okay. I was at 88 Hotel, so that's a cargo yeah. specialist. So yeah. we operate, we're a transportation course, so we operate trains, planes, we load mm. ships and all yeah. that, um, cranes. But remember, that stuff when you get out of the military, should you, should you so choose? And you don't need a high score to get it, <laughs> to get that job. No, I lift things up <laughs> but, and put them down. Right. So <laughs> once, right, right. You just, I mean, you got a little fear of heights. You're going to be like, it's just you in the glass looking down at the ship, moving the boom and the, the, the containers onto the ship. But I will say that when you get out, if you join a shipyard or something like that, yeah. crane operators make, I think, starting at around like 140000 a year. They yeah. make real good money. Well, you know what world, happened so. when, when the states want to say you have to be certified in this just so they can get your tax dollars to apply for the application for certification. With the certification comes a minimum high, a minimum range for, for, for requirements. So it was good that those guys, thank God for unions, right? You want me to be certified in this. How about you pay me for this? Right. Remember, remember we had that fun conversation about like um you um i think there were certain there were certain um, um agencies that were trying to hire you for your expertise mm -hmm. and i made the joke like they want a freak uh fucking Vers versace resume right <laughs> but they give you but they offer an old navy salary yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right job requirement must have six years experience or 10 years experience in a relative field right master's right. degree uh, um required doctorate preferred and then you get to the bottom line salary it's yeah like... <laughs> no but that's some some people Child service please. members don't realize the value of their mos training because they get out and they don't realize that that license that yeah. the civilians make it so hard to get is transferable with for like two or three years yeah. once you get out and then they let that time pass and then now they would have to start from scratch yeah um, my, mine was a uh, i was a 52 delta mm -hmm. uh, generator mechanic so my, my ait was um 16 weeks um oh. and we worked alongside with air conditioning and refrigeration repair people um turbine engine repair people all four branches marines air force uh fort belvoir that was virginia so mm -hmm. and yeah so it's crazy because this is the reason why there's a minimum term for enlistment. Like the more spe specific your MOS is, the more years you have to commit. Like if I wanted to get in for accounting, right? I think that school was, that AIT was almost a year. So there's no way, yeah. there's no way the army's going to say you get to only get to sign up for two years. 
<laughs> they spend right. this year training you and it's like, ah, uh, you know what? Hang out my second year. I'm out. I'm an accountant. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Yeah. And people that don't serve in the military have to appreciate what 16 weeks is. 16 weeks on this specific occupational specialty is equivalent to four years of college because you're not doing it three hours a week, three hours a week, uh, an hour and 20 minutes twice, tw you know, like two classes a week. You're not doing, doing it three it hours time. a week. You're doing full it time. nine to five. You're not doing any electives. You're not doing any uh, core curriculum to go with your major. It is your major balls deep um, for three for for sixteen weeks. So that is equivalent and, yeah. to a college degree. And, I think and this is why there, there are specialties. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you're good. Um, so I think that something that people mistake about AIT is like, oh, you just went through a training. No, we get grades. We can get kicked out of the military if we don't pass this. This is yeah. like you're going through a really hard course and they're smoking you like a dog too on top like of that cheap cigarette <laughs> yeah like my drill sergeant that's said it. like a cheap cigarette <laughs> right right yep mm -hmm. that's it well i was tougher than a two dollar steak so i got through um but you're right you get graded on this i dude i can't imagine like if there was like a MOS for theater, for like theater performers or like actors <laughs> and you don't and you like fail the Shakespeare section, you get like a <laughs> shake, a dishonorable Shakespearean discharge or some <laughs> a failure shit. to adapt. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's crazy. So, yeah, I was second in my class. I was a uh, uh, great. I had a 92.28 GPA on my, my whatever. So um, I was second to last and then finished second. I started to, because I there was one test. I um, I thought question eight was nine and nine was ten, so I basically got every question wrong, like one of my tests. And then uh, I was I was second to last. It runs in the blood. Yeah, dude. Phew, tell me about it. I wonder who my family members are. But um, <laughs> but I aced like I aced the rest of the the whatever. I got hundreds on every other test, so I finished with right. a ninety two. So mental illness we we covered like different layers of that and i thought that was important can you give our audience a brief description of what what you we determine what ptsd is what is PS, ptsd well ptsd um has several d diagnostic criteria so just because you're experiencing one thing that's like it doesn't mean that that's what you have um so you don't want to self-diagnose but PTSD is when you have experienced something that was so traumatic in your life that to this point and moving forward, and sometimes you can get PTSD and not realize that you have it or not have any symptoms for years until later. Um, that happens with veterans. There are people who join the military. Remember where uh, Jason just said that they go for kids from, you know, not the the wealthiest of places so they join the military sometimes already having ptsd okay before you even join yeah. so ptsd is where you have it's it doesn't mean it's shell shock syndrome or anything like that it means that you had an experience that was so traumatic that now it still impacts you you're having lack of sleep you're having night terrors you're um having outbursts just angry outbursts or outbursts of just certain feelings at random times um you, sometimes you have lack of sleep. Sometimes you are hyper vigilant and you can't sleep. Um, so there's, you can be insomnia, you know, you can have insomnia, you can have hypersomnia, you can um, not want to eat. You can have really serious uh, survivor's guilt. And can, a, a big symptom of PTSD is replaying something that happened in your head over and over and over. And it continues to um, impact your mental health and make you a little bit just jumpy for everything that you do like you you can't just walk down the street and pt a perfect sign of ptsd a firework going off somebody doesn't like to be around them they may have a reason why that loud bang noise is something that would replay or trigger something to come back up in their head from before so ptsd is very serious with military service people and also you can get it as a child really so a lot of people have it who weren't in the military. So there was this stigma for a while that, it, oh, no, only service members have PTSD. And that's what we're talking about right now. So, um, of course, we're, we're on a service, uh, 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 military lives matter. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be like, well, all lives matter. But I'm just saying that it is very possible. Um, not possible. It is definitely true that people have PTSD who are not in the military as well. 100%. So, oh, yeah, there you go. You got some, like. 
Yeah, I just wanted to, to run through that while you're going through that. You see basically. where they're talking about shell shock, where they say uh, yes. it was known as the past to be um, shell shock. But now they've actually kind of broadened what the meaning of it is, because it's not just for combat. No, no, it's more than that. I mean, you could have PTSD if your mom beat the hell out of you for freaking five years straight, dude, right? You, she's la she laughing. <laughs> but... Yeah, no, think about that, right? Like, think about some form of abuse as a child, maybe maybe some form of sexual assault. Like, you, some people can never have sex with their partner uh, 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 the, uh, the, a certain way because it brings back a flashback. they can't be alone in a room. Or sometimes people will prefer, some people prefer a male doctor because they prefer one or a female doctor mm -hmm. because they prefer one. But other people prefer that because they just don't feel safe in a room alone with the opposite sex. Somebody had some, someone, someone fucked with someone's head like that, dude. That's a, it's equivalent to a wartime situation. That's so sad, dude. Man, that sucks, dude. What? What, Mary Beth? So, reason number three. This is one where I think you might want to disagree with, maybe. This is, um, lack of low cost housing. Now, this is tricky because it really depends on where you live, right? Like, I got back to Brooklyn and wanted to live, you know, was thinking about VA loans or what real estate companies knew. Did it have a VA specialist? And really a lot of them didn't. And a lot of them were like, look, you can get a regular loan for, for the same amount of th uh, whatever and this and that one and for the same rate and for the same interest and all that stuff. But I think what they failed to realize is def defaulting on a loan and who compensates it. And that's, mm -hmm. um, can you give someone this is unfair to you, a brief synopsis on the difference between a VA loan and a regular loan. Um, a VA loan is if you're going to purchase a home. Um, they keep changing, shifting the rules around. Um, I think they guarantee you 4% or less down, or not down, but uh, in interest. And then they give it to you zero down. And the VA will purchase the home from the bank for you up to a certain amount um it this is dependent on your credit though i think you can once you pass i think 640 you're eligible for your va loan but if you go below 640 or it might be 620 it's one of those two um but basically the military will purchase a home for you um and then you will pay it back to the military at a lower interest rate that you probably would have had before but um again i think i i told you before in a conversation you know uh I think they should just be flat out at least buying one house for the veterans. <laughs> like, yeah. Why are you making them pay any interest rate mm -hmm. if you're going to make them pay for it? I mean, the, the the least you could get is, hey, go overseas, risk your life, get all these injuries. And when you get back, we'll give you a house. If that house burns be down, worth you know, we don't know what <laughs> to like, you. I'm like, sign me up. I get a house. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. But. I mean, How about just, I just think that it's more it's they're more deserving of just the. But I, I will say that the VA loan, it is great. I don't want them to take it away from anyone. No. <laughs> so. And again, it really depends on where you are. There are people that um, in certain areas where they're they're ju they just they're more educated on how the VA loan works. You don't really see that in New York City. I'm from New York originally. I'm in L.A. right now. Well, not L.A. I'm in the bubble. Um, Hermosa Beach. But. Which LA is, County. Yeah, which so. LA County, but like <laughs> like it's so weird. The bubble is a real thing. It's that's you've mm -hmm. been here. It's 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 like this la it's a true la la land. But it is. But yeah, so New York didn't find I didn't I had trouble doing it because I didn't find a lot of people who understood it. And somehow it was supposed to be my responsibility to understand how it works. And again, it might have been in that very thick packet they gave you three days to understand, you know, um, and it's crazy because if everything is in there when you leave, but if there's something in there you don't understand, it's like, who do you reach out to? And you don't know where. And, and the thing is, there is this kind of wall because there are people that can help you and provide you with advice and services. And, and mind you, I'm, I wasn't someone that was homeless. I'm not someone that suffered from PTSD. I was someone that was trying to find a way for veterans to help me with my loan, to help me understand the education benefits better and how, you know, the Army College Fund. And I had trouble finding people. 
So if I had some trouble finding someone and I was just a kid, you know, an average kid from Brooklyn, how how are we going to get these these ve- these homeless veterans off the street who, like you said, under, under a general blanket are just mistrusting? They just mm-hmm. don't. They have reason. I had every reason to trust them because the, I thought the army did right by me, you know, and I, and I couldn't get these answers. <laughs> so right. how the hell are these veterans supposed to get these answers? who don't trust the government and who are not. And it's just, and, and like you said, it's just, they feel like they got beat down just, just to ask the question, <laughs> you know? Right. Or not get beat down, but like beat down going through the process, uh, the tedious process of getting something that, you know, may not be there to them. Well, you know, there's a, there's a veterans transition program as well now, as long as you're within 360 days after being discharged okay um they do assist you with oh moving. post post ets right. post exactly okay. 360 days post um so you know those kinds of resources i will go ahead especially on an individual basis you sh- there is such a plethora of resources for service members and veterans that literally they would have to be asked individually in order for them to get dished out because us just putting stuff down there, it's probably not going to address people's particular situation. And it's not a one size fits all. Um, But I can, you know, we are definitely chock full of resources over here. So um, I'm happy to help in any way I can. If if JJ reaches out to me or Jason reaches out to me, I like JJ. Right, right. (laughs) You get to call me that. I mean, it's okay. I get to call you. I get to call you Gigi. Um, Right. But if you look at that article, you were talking about, um, I guess, the VA loan versus a regular loan and a regular loan. Okay, they can make your interest rate something crazy and the bank can it. It's a lot more messy. I think it's even harder for you to get evicted or to like if you default on your mortgage, if you have a VA loan, they'll work with you. But um, that article really talks about how veterans who are injured have a hard time finding housing and. I think you were saying that I may uh, disagree with that, but I actually agree very much. I'm not one of those people who tend to blame the victims, you know, how they're like, oh, black people are thought of as aggressive because they're aggressive. You know, it's not you can't go. It's not just an umbrella term. Right. (laughs) So, no, um, I do think that there's a lot of injured veterans that aren't getting what they need. And they it's not because it's not out there for them. It's because they don't know the resources. I don't know if you've ever sat down and just thought about it, but if you play, if you ever thought back and said, you know, if I would have played my cards a little bit different, if I would have known that this existed, if I would have clicked this button instead of that, that button, I'd be this much happier or I'd be this much richer or if I didn't destroy that one opportunity. Mm-hmm. So really veterans have all of that too. I mean, they're still people. So they just need the resources and they have to ask. And that's where I think a lot of the problem comes in. They're not asking or they're asking, but they're not asking the right people. Right. So I worked in a medical practice for 17 years, so I already had pretty good insurance. We were affiliated with Wild Cornell Medical College, one of the best medical colleges in the world. Um, When my boss retired, um, I left because I was forget about this nine nine to five stuff. And I gave the James Peters uh, Veterans um, Veterans Hospital a go in the Bronx. There was one in Manhattan, but they closed down temporarily and they referred me to that. And this place was awesome. Um, All of the doctors from hospital for special surgery were there three days a week. So, so, and me, I'm an athlete, you know, so I'm always worried about my knee and worried about my elbow, worried about stuff like that. So these guys, you know, they're, some of them are sports specialists, you know, sports medicine doctors. So, and the funding was pretty, the funding was there. And it was so good, in fact, my wife, who was with a big, uh, I'm not going to name where the financial group she works with, she tried, um, She asked me about her insurance plan. I was like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> you know, put me on for dental, which we're gonna, we might talk about later. Um, yeah. But then I moved to L.A., enter the L.A. Um, VA. Horror show. Absolute hot mess. I, believe I, ran, I ran to my wife's insurance so fast. <laughs> <laughs> they thought she had two husbands. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, wait, you got, wait, is this for two guys? Because that's the same guy I just called, but he, he sounded different. <laughs> yeah. um, now, here's the point I'm trying to make. The allocation of, of sorry, the, the resources, the funding is there. I just think the management of said fund of resources is not. So I guess 
how much does that come into play? Like, because we, we hear different stories about VA. Uh, my parent, uh, my girl's parents, you know, her father's a vet, West Virginia. It's pretty good. Their VA is pretty good. The New York one. It's awesome. Yeah, and, and with like minded vets like myself, I felt I felt like I was at home when we were all taking care of each other, you know, it was a good, which is a great feeling, the indescribable mm -hmm. feeling that a lot of people who didn't serve can't can't compartmentalize. Um, but yet L.A. is a mess. So how much does it have to do with the mismanagement of those resources? It's, it's I guess what I'm trying to ask is throwing money at a problem, the ultimate solution here. Um. Loaded the way question. that throwing Sorry. money at the problem could be a solution would be if they could hire more people, caseworkers, social workers, to be reaching out. Because I don't know your veteran population in L.A. Um, I know in Virginia it's very, very high. I know yeah. that. Big time. Um, yeah. Right. So where in the locations I've lived in in the past 10 years, it's been mostly military areas. And so they have a very large veteran population. So it's either sink or swim. You either get enough doctors and enough um, case workers and enough people to pick up the phones. And if you don't, it's going to collapse because there's just too many of us just running up to it. Like, hey, we need care. So I don't know if LA, if you have a high um, veteran population, then it could be collapsing because they don't have enough people working there who in who lives in LA and does social work and lives really, really well. I don't know what it is that's stopping. Like that's that gap needs to be bridged, but I'm not sure exactly. Or if you have a low veteran population, so they just kind of don't worry about keeping the system on such a pristine level because there's not as many people over there to be concerned about. So it could be like such a fact, like so many factors, but I do think that money of course is always an issue. Um, of course, throwing money at something could fix it because when you throw money at something, you have more employees. And when you have more employees and more specialists to do their jobs, then you have more service. Right. So it's always a money issue at the end. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to ask is how can two institutions have almost the same amount of money? Like California has more people, right? So if you count the fact that they have more people and New York has less people, but New York has more veterans, it's almost, so we can call that a wash. <laughs> we call that a push, you know? And it's, I, and I don't know, maybe, uh, um, yeah, nothing wrong with what a little bit, of, nothing wrong with a little bit of money in our pocket. Huh? What about, what about the district though? Because I mean, all right, so LA has one, right? but so Orange I live County in Fredericksburg, yeah. Virginia. Right. So then I'm sure Hollywood has one. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, not maybe each beach, but I'm sure that every county at least has a VA. So it could be pretty decent in the one next door. Maybe right. it's just, I don't know if you've Or they could have one representing, places. one in LA County representing all of them, which, which might be logistically right, a mess. Would, right. would that be, be the logistical mess of it? There's just that one for like be. all of them. That could be. Yeah. I think that, you know, there is always a place that you can go to that's trash, but it doesn't reflect everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. You could walk into yeah. a VA in the next county over and be like, no, this place is nice. And they're right. on top of their stuff. Yeah, I didn't so know. It really. I really didn't want to ask that question because that was like, as far as finance and the research, that's out of our, that was out of our wheelhouse of what we were talking about. But I just oh, thought yeah. I just thought it was interesting. And again, bringing it up. Um, you know, people who are listening, they're definitely going to want to chime in, you know, like my listeners are not going to be like, you shouldn't talk about that. My listeners are going to be like, you know what, that's a good question. And it, but, but it was out of your wheelhouse, but I got something for you. So, right. but, that's, but, but that's the purpose of the podcast, but that's the know? purpose of the podcast, you know? So, right. yeah. Um, so, all right. So how do we, as far as getting veterans housing, I mean, what the hell do we do? We could, do we go out on the street and get them? <laughs> I mean, nope. Yeah. Nope. Uh, so honestly, the, the veterans, although they're traumatized, they're adults and there is veterans housing and it is available. There are shortages in some places. I'm not going to negate anybody's experience, but I will say that you have to go up to your veterans affairs, make these phone calls. Every time you really, really want something, you have to jump through some hoops. And with the VA, it might be a few more hoops. 
But if you really want to make it happen, especially, you know, this, this is just an empowering message to any service member or veteran. You jump through a lot of hoops, more than most people you know. If you want to get housing and you want these resources, you can do that. You can. Mm-hmm. It's an option. It's there. If you need the phone numbers, if you need the resources, we can help. You got to reach out. But it can happen. It's there for you. It's just they make it sound so difficult, like the way you said about, like, why send somebody through a whole process just to get their, some help with their arm? Sometimes it it <laughs> in, in like New York terms, it be like that sometimes. <laughs> you know yeah, it's saying? true. Yep. Yeah. Be like that. Yeah, it do. So, yeah. So that one must participate in the one's own salvation. Exactly. Right. That's yeah. that's what to I'm quote, saying. I mean, to quote, like I said, uh, Mother we should Teresa. be chasing them down, but we're <laughs> very far away from that. Yeah. Very far. We're not going to be chasing veterans down. Now, there is actually like a homeless veterans coalition with each VA. And it is it does consist of social workers who go out into the community who try to assist um, the homeless uh, veterans and give them the resources. They have flyers and pamphlets. Call this. Come here. But they can't force them. And again, you know, they're going through so much trauma that you trying to push them or force them into something is probably not the most useful scenario either. No. Well, you got veterans that are not just depressed, not just mentally out of it. It's so crazy, too, because now that every time I see someone talking to himself and yelling, I'm, I'm like, please don't say that's one of our, right? Please don't say he's a veteran. I mean, please, that dude, that dude don't know karate, but he knows crazy, you know? Um, I mean, so on that level, I know it's hard to say that we can't help that person and we can't force that person to do something. We, and we can't, but we can't have him on the street either. Do you know what happens? You know what happens, right? If we don't treat the sick, we incarcerate them. Right. Right. You know, and that's and not, I don't think that's the American way either. We, we, you no, know, we, and it depends on the community, um, really, because there's, you would see, like you said, it's a bubble there. Every like community that you go to, it's just so different. Like, mm-hmm. Who knows? There's probably places in Texas where they're like, oh, that's Joe. He's the old veteran who he likes to be outside and he doesn't want a place to live. But that's our buddy. We bring him food every day and Mm -hmm. ask him if he needs anything. And when he's ready for a house, he can come get one because we're ready to house him. (laughs) You know, I had this dream. (laughs) I had this dream like Hermosa police were um, at nighttime were like, getting a paddy wagon and like gathering all up all the homeless people and driving them to venice and just like dumping them off and like <laughs> ready hut, 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 hut. gone <laughs> and i'm like damn that's where they are <laughs> they're yeah, on. no right so it's not it's it's not the american way but it, you're right it is the american way to go ahead and just throw them into jail or institutionalize them mm-hmm. i mean at least they still have their freedom they chose that it, it is mostly mental illness that is coming with them choosing to stay homeless the people who right. choose to stay homeless but those who want the resources they are there for them and i know that they a lot of times i speak to people and it because again i don't want to take away from anybody's experience i've spoken to people who are like look I've been homeless with my kids and I'm a veteran and my father was a service member and his father before him. And I can't seem to get help. And it's because, you know, I'll say, well, did you talk to this person? They'll say, I talked to this person, that person, this person. Now I have to wait 30 days for this and I have to do that and fill this out. And it it is a process. Like I said, it is a process. Um, There's also, you know, a lot of people think that the American Red Cross can only be contacted by people who have service members overseas and they need to get them back or somebody died. That's not the case. If you're homeless, you can also call the Red Cross. They have a homeless veteran sector where they'll actually talk to you and see if they can get you housed. There's so many resources. Um, I didn't know that. Wow. You just have to sit down and walk through each of the resources with someone. You need to call it. It's because of my line of work, I have these things, but I really don't before I'm your typical average veteran before I got into this field of more of like military specialty. I promise you, I didn't know a lot of this stuff existed. Right. And most of it is no cost to the service member. Yeah. 
The mil well, when I served, the military hotline didn't exist. You know. Oh, like, you're talking about the veteran suicide line? Yeah, the ver the veterans. Um, um, well, like I said, without giving away your your job your your job or your company, one one of oh, your. I don't work for that. That's okay. No. Oh, you don't do that anymore. No, that's not what I do. Oh, okay. That's that's not who I work for. Oh, okay. Saying. All right, cool. <clears throat> but I still I'm still kind of like CIA'd. I can't really put my stuff out. <laughs> no, you can't. That's fine. No, but we we look how much we covered <laughs> without without actually saying. You don't need it. And <laughs> again, I can still provide all the resources that need to be given. Mm -hmm. I just can't put certain words out. That's all. No, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. So you served. I served. You served. Yep. Your first Desert storm. You're, you're in the, the house. first. You're the first female in our, in the family to serve, right? In your family, in the family. Uh, yeah, I am the yeah. first. I believe so. I never really yeah. thought about it, but yeah. Yeah. You've. I was in and out before. Afghanistan was a public thing because we've always had um, contractors and we've always had ambas ambassadors in mm. Afghanistan on some level. Um, and there's been this big thing hitting the news about like everybody he and Hong about the way we pulled out of Afghanistan. Mm. Um, there was a, there was kind of like this better mm. way to do it. And maybe I'm disappointed in that how. But it also leads to the question, if not this way, how? You know, like generally, look, you know, we both know enough officers, NCOs, and a bunch of field grade officers and this and that to know that when you leave somewhere, you don't completely leave. Like you leave, you leave like I said, ambassadors, or you leave contractors, you leave 2,500 people or whatever and this and that to make sure that this, right. this or that. But I have mixed feelings on that because we can't be there forever. This is not a place we could permanently occupy. It's not like Germany. It's not like Korea. These, these, they're not, I mean, they're not really our ally, right? Because it's the war, the war is still happening. Like if, like picture like us being in station in Germany, but they're still fucking Nazis, right? You know what I'm saying? So um, we're allies, but not really. You know, we're not, we're not complete allies. And it's, and it seems like this unwinnable thing. So for me, personally, I'm gonna give you the floor in a minute. We had to get the hell out of there, you know, and, and the, I don't really think there was a, a perfect how I just think there are levels of stronger house and weaker house. Your thoughts on what the hell we're doing there and, and us getting out. Sorry, I'm sipping my drink. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Salute. <laughs> so I think that there yes. uh, are groups of veterans who feel different ways um, and service members who are yeah. still actively um, serving. Um, for me, in my experience, um, we lost soldiers. We lost kids, brothers, husbands, wives. And I mean, like the people I deployed with were mostly my age. They were like 18, 19 they're over there serving a purpose. The purpose when we went over there, it was right after 9-11, really. That's what really caused this whole Afghanistan thing. So when we went over there, our purpose was to remove the Taliban um, and to oh, strength, strengthen their countries so that not only would they stop attacking us, but, we, you know, of course, the U.S., like you said before, we got to get all up in everybody's business. <laughs> But there was an attack that became personal, and that was 9-11, and that just passed. So, you know, that's a, a really sad day to observe. Um, sorry to everybody who lost someone. Um, but I will say that, you know, we went there to go. We gave them our old uniforms. We gave them our old M16s, M4s, and we trained them. Them. We trained those those um, Afghani soldiers and we helped them to strengthen their army and their political system. Um, and we did it for 20 years. We lost a lot of soldiers, people's kids, our people. We are now invested, not just financially or with the military, America, like emotionally invested, brought sent their kids over there. Um, and to know that all these people died, to know that now there's people with TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, PTSD, 
living with all of these problems because of this war for 20 years, which really our purpose was to strengthen that military so that that Taliban wouldn't come back and take over again. We did all that work to do that. And for Biden to snatch everybody out so quickly. Now, remember, I'm not a politician. Yeah. I'm not up on that level. I'm sure. No, but he, are, are he, but far. he's the he's the commander in chief, right? Right. There, right. there are certain people that give you suggestions, and you can follow them or not. Uh, because at the end command. of the day, right? No matter what happens, every soldier that dies under a certain president's watch, he has to fall on that sword. Right. Right. Yeah. So, like so Bush, it, didn't Bush have to fall on the sword for um, Iraq? Even absolutely. though I thought, even though absolutely. I thought he, I thought he got honey dicked into it. <laughs> but but because right, I don't think he's that smart to know, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> honey dick means that that you have nothing vested in it. And then you have your advisor saying we got to go in and then you're like, Dick, come here for a second. Yep. How sure are you that they have weapons of mass destruction? 100 <laughs> percent. Sure. Sure. Uh, Mr. President, we're cocksure that the, the right. evidence so is solid. Rock hard. Yeah. So, of course, him as the president, you, he's got to go in. Right. So a lot of people blame him. And I don't think it's completely his fault. But like just like right. Biden, if you're the commander in chief, you got to fall on that sword. And I'm sorry to interrupt with that. I wanted to get that caveat in. No, absolutely. And and. Like I said, I'm not a politician. I'm not up on the higher level. I, I see this as a firsthand veteran right. mm -hmm. who, you know, deployed to Afghanistan. Right. Um, but after all of this, I would just say that was there not a way where this could have been a little bit more strategically done? I know that we had to leave. We couldn't stay there forever. I didn't want us to stay there forever. They made it sound like we left dying. like a thief in the night, though. Right. Do you, do you like expect overnight? Like, but my question is, do you think nobody fucking knew we were just leaving like that we just exodus the hell out of there and okay. no one and all of these countries are saying that no one had a damn clue we were doing that that's well, what, now you're asking like those top secret questions where i'm sure that people knew on top of that there was a deal i think earlier in the year at least with biden that everybody would be out by august 31st right but instead of and that deal that they made i believe was with the Taliban, because this right. is who, who we're negotiating with at, at, at since earlier in the year. Right. But what, like, I guess all the work that you would have put in as a service member, right? You would think that if we could strategically leave so that we could keep that army strong and keep that government, their army strong and keep that yep. government intact yep. because we're pulling out slowly and making sure that they're still standing strong and established as opposed to like you said boom leaving overnight now the whole government collapsed the president fled and the taliban oh they're just in charge of everything now so now all those 20 years to a lot of veterans feels like a waste um if you go to the va or you you are enrolled in the va check your emails they they do have resources for veterans about how they're feeling about all of this right. um and the, the the work they put in people really need counseling for this they're like wait i don't have a leg and I'm missing four fingers and I have a TBI and I talk, you know, a little strained, like I'm having a hard time even keeping my head up straight over this war that look what it, it resulted in exactly. We just postponed the problem. Yeah. Well, I need to, we owe it to ourselves, um, whatever political beliefs we have, but we owe it to ourselves as patriots and as veterans to remind our audience that, um, Al Qaeda attacked us on 9/11, not the Taliban, because the the talking right. point was that the Taliban's gonna come land, they're gonna go crash planes at us again, and it's one of those things where, like you said, people, we need this hotline and we need this assistance because people need to know why they were there. People need to know who our our, our enemies were at one time and who our allies were at another time because I thought the Taliban, if memory serves me correctly, I thought the Taliban helped us fight Al-Qaeda. Uh, um, so this, the reason why we we can even talk to them in the first place is because at one point, at one point in, in these two decades, these people were our allies and our enemies and our allies and our enemies again. So mm -hmm. before... You got some Republican space ranger or some 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 liberal some liberal out there um, some crazy come some crazy anti war liberal out there talk about the Taliban this Taliban that and and, and associated with nine eleven they need to remember Al Qaeda was the one that that, that flew that, planes that did 9 I mean yeah. for the people that don't 
believe in conspiracies and have their head in a goddamn rabbit hole about, you know, what happened to Building 7 and this and that. It is widely accepted that Al-Qaeda attacked us, which got us into a war against the Taliban and into a war against Iraq. (laughs) So, uh, um, So if there is an association between the Taliban and Al Qaeda that made us made us go over there and as a general blanket lumped them in the same category. If there's something we want to say about that or you want to say about please, that, say that now. Please keep them separate. Right. Yeah. yeah no. So so nine eleven triggered the problems that we had over there. That the right. reason why we're over there. But yes, it is a separate group that <laughs> conducted the nine eleven attacks. And but when we were over there, we weren't necessarily working against Al Qaeda. Maybe that was some kind of top secret thing. We were working to help this country not be taken over by Taliban. This wasn't some. That's why Taliban is what we're dealing with now. The, you but know, do, over there. Do, can you appreciate the illogical connection? No, we get yes, attacked I by can. Not, we get I attacked see, you know 9/11 see by Al Qaeda, yeah. causing us to go to Afghanistan and fight the Taliban. Right. I'm right. not an anti-war guy. I'm I'm a patriot. I serve. <laughs> right. So those chicken hawks can go kiss my ass. Okay. Right. Um. Wow. <laughs> right. Keep your facts. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, no, but it's something that people have to be careful of because they. You've seen it on the news, and it's repeated. We were there because of 9-11. We were there to make sure the Taliban didn't do this to us again. And, and uh, man, this pro- I'm probably not going to be able to upload this podcast on Facebook. Uh, but but right. um, um, it's, we needed to get the hell out of there. And I agree with you in the manner and how we did it was ex- uh, way too expeditious for the time and the money and the lives lost. The, uh, uh, which is the, the, the to me, always going to be the common denominator more the than put in. more than money. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh. the people that like they, they were over there fighting. They weren't over there fighting Al Qaeda. Hmm. They were over there strengthening Afghanistan's military and right. working against Taliban. And I was in during that time. It was Taliban mm-hmm. that we were working to right. make sure that they did not continue to terrorize the people of Afghanistan and to yeah. strengthen their government and military. You got an, now, en- an enemy without a face 9/11 too. triggering that mm-hmm. to happen, <clears throat> which, yeah, but again, it is separate. Right. But we were in those countries because we were trying to avoid another problem, which is funny because if you talk about it that way, it's like, yeah, you're trying to avoid another problem, but you're actually dealing with other people. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, it's called the Mary Beth. It's called the war on terror. Right. How long? And this is not there's no answer to this question. How long is the war on terror supposed to last? The war on terror as a phrase is endless. It can go on as long as you want. Well, like you said, for whatever top secret reasons, um, Iraq was pretty much a money grab for Halliburton, right? I mean, don't even get, don't even get me started on Cheney or whatever. Or twenty seven billion dollars <laughs> a month, right? Twenty seven billion dollars a month to I didn't fight know that, that one, war in Iraq. The number. Yeah, it was either Iraq and Afghanistan combined or just Iraq, but one way or another, twenty seven billion dollars a month. Then you take that and you count all the months in a year, or whatever. You're the mathematician, you and you fill in the blanks for me on that one. But, but oh, it God. was the war, but. People need to have this conversation and understand that getting out of Afghanistan is a, is a good thing because as we continue to get out of these places one at a time, the term, the war on terror, which I thought had no conclusion, which had no end, which was just perpetual, which was just re- residual and, and, and always regime changing. It's always about us fucking defoliating and like uh, uh, being with a coup or whatever and this and that. Um, the war on terror can last, as a term, can last as long as the war on women. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Have you ever heard that stupid term? If this is a war on women. I'm like, as long as they're women and men, <laughs> that war's never going to end. <laughs> Great. No conclusion. How yeah. about men just get together and say, you won. <laughs> Y'all win! <laughs> that might be the solution. It is a solution. There's more of you and you don't fight fair. Uh, um, if, yeah, if you put it together that way, that's just like <laughs> saying, yeah, okay, well, we pulled out of Afghanistan and now, like you said, that's that's a perfect example. <laughs> Men get together and say, women, you win. We mm-hmm. basically pulled out and we're like, okay, yeah. we're done. Well, the so, reason, But the reason yeah. why this talking point on 
the Taliban and this and that has survived for this this many months is because they prey on Americans' lack of education on culture. You, mm -hmm. I, I, my boy James Barker is from Texas. All right, he always accused me of trying to be the smart guy, or whatever. But that is a smart dude. He's a Black Hawk operator. All right. He, had, he knows he's got friends that think the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are the same people. He got friends in Texas that say, we ain't got time to dice up our Middle East people. They just, they the same person. And, and I, I really hate how the media and everybody's preying on the lack of intelligence or educational awareness or even the, the, the wantonness to educate yourself on it. They don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't know and they don't want to know, right? There are certain, certain people that, that are... Um, they say they don't understand because they're dismissive. And there are certain people that say they don't understand because they want to understand. There are so many uh, people, American people that represent the former and not the latter, that this is, this is just bad. This is just bad for us as a nation. This is bad for us yeah. as a people, dude. You know? I mean, Chris Rock made a joke out of that with like white people. He's talking about black people. He's like, we ain't got time to dice up our white people. <laughs> if you're Romanian, <laughs> you're a Romanian cracker. <laughs> you're a Russian, <laughs> you're a Russian cracker. <laughs> you know? Right. So so right. I mean, so that's the best way I know how to convey that joke, but because and that's how I feel like how a lot of Amer American feels. Especially they are. especially they in are. the Bible belt, especially in the inland uh Midwest. And I just saw it. They ain't got um, time to dice up that Middle East people. Don Lemon on CNN, he said that they did a survey asking, a survey for all Americans of whoever actually did the survey. Right. That 60% of Americans actually did not know that we were still at war with Afghanistan. Yeah. So. 60%. 60%. That's more than, so, so the half, half. Yeah. Didn't know we were still at war. It just was just not a thought. I got to tell you, the way we start, the day we start basing our day-to-day -day operations on bandwagon fallacies, man, I might, I might just move to Italy, I swear, where, you know, or just on some island, maybe Australia where it's safe. I mean, this, this way, when everyone <laughs> sends each other to hell, you know, I'll tell them, hey, I'm down here, you know, send me a refrigerator magnet. Um, so... <laughs> No, but I really, I'm glad I, that was like a personal opinion thing. And, um, and for the, the intensive purposes of the podcast, again, uh, there are people, there are things where we sought, we sought the advice of people who, in whom that's their expertise in their wheelhouse, but, uh, you and I qualify to speak on these things. And it's such an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast where you and I can just kick it back and forth and talk all this stuff. Right. And well, you know, you. this is, I'd love to have you back on at some other point where we could talk about more fun stuff. We could talk about Zuckerberg, oh, yeah. Zuckerberg or like, I oh, don't know, Mar Martha Stewart making freaking edibles for dogs right like <laughs> you know no, she's got you that can now <laughs> do like a survey for like mm -hmm. veterans or something that mm -hmm. says hey these two points do you feel like it's going to be beneficial that we just pulled out of afghanistan the way we did or b what veterans feel like this was a waste of time like this was a whole waste of time mm -hmm. like all these years well if you work. did a poll if we did a poll saying that are are, are you glad we're out of Af afghanistan there's not right. a there's not a whole bunch of veterans that are gonna, that are gonna say no they want to still be there yeah you I'm, know? I'm they're they're glad you pulled out but okay maybe the way that they were pulled out all of them like, well that'll be the higher percentage right all of them are gonna right. be like that's a fucked up way to pull out because we know right. we know and again you asked what is a better way to pull out and you know i couldn't answer that i really no. i don't know and there's also, I mean, let's, we're out but now. let's not forget the human side. Let's not forget the emotional investment of the people that in Afghanistan that were there for us as much as we were there for them. Let's oh, not forget yes, about those people are, who were who, who are aiding us in our, in our, per yeah. Right. It's public knowledge where there, um, there are, we have refugee camps everywhere. I think we were able to save, I know it's a high number of thousands, but I know that there's still more than 50% of them that we didn't, we weren't able to get out mm -hmm. among, I think some Americans. Yeah. Um, but I would say that, you know, we 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 didn't stick all the way true to our word um, to Not those interpreters way. and those people who risked their lives and their families to help us, and, which is another just negative thing about this whole situation. Yeah, that's that's. We pulled out slower. We might have been able to probably get everybody if they had a tactical kind of way to leave. Nice. I mean, I get you to sing karaoke next time we're together. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, Jay, that's the easiest question you asked me this entire podcast. It is. It is. But I, I did my best to answer yeah. the best I can. You had fun in California? 
Oh, I had a blast. I had yeah. a blast. Got to see you play some volleyball, hear you sing some karaoke. Yeah, man. Got to That's meet all the cool. people. Yeah. It was. The weather's real nice out there. Um, mm -hmm. Beaches are beautiful. And isn't it amazing how, like, kids, like, by some, like, instinctive psychological initiative want to take care of their own? Like, you brought your kid, you have a 13-month-old, um, and my four-year-old was, like, so so um like helpful like no no go over here you're you're good mm -hmm. you're good it's just the she instinctively wants to help and i've never seen yeah usually like, like my kid my toy? yeah don't sit with me but yeah. that's but listen four-year-olds you're usually all about self uh, they don't get what they want Wah! this <laughs> one for like five straight days or four straight days was doing nothing but unselfish things when it came to your kid and that was just like that was just a it was, that was just really a weird sweet. thing to see. I was like, who the hell is this? Who is this? Who is this child? <laughs> mm -hmm. Who is this? Who is this? Who is this act of kindness child? So, um, <laughs> do you have a, um, yeah. what's your Insta handle? So people can stalk you. People creep on you. Um, you have an Instagram I don't handle? Do, okay. So oh, I you don't, don't do, do Instagram? Instagram. <laughs> I don't do, I've never had Snapchat. I don't do any mm. of that. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm on Facebook. All right, cool. Um, all right. So, they're just gonna have to message me then. <laughs> or yeah, you can got, always um tag me. Yeah, if I could you do, want, that. And, um, yeah. do that. Yeah. No, because we're not trying to give away too much of what you do because you'd have to kill right. them. You tell them, but you'd have to kill them. Um, well, Facebook won't tell you anything I do. Don't no, worry. they don't. <laughs> no, I don't even know if that's your real name. <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> You're so silly. Oh jeez. All right, so I think we're done. I think we're out of here. Listen, guys, Gigi might love you guys. Mary Beth, that, <laughs> sorry, that's your real name. Mary Beth might love, like, might love you, but I don't love you guys. In fact, I can't stand you. In fact, I think we're out of here. I think for all of you at home, for all of you on your line at Starbucks, for all of you getting your second wind in the afternoon, for all of you eating dinner, because on the East Coast, it's past dinner time. This is ice cream time. For Gigi, Rose Gingrich, I'm Jason DeBiss. This is option number 113. Stay with me after this, and we're out. Come check out the Option Podcast on optiondb.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports Handle. You're going to love what you hear.